I didn't have a chance to get myself coordinated with Jen, but for some reason we always come up with sort of related topics, but uh, taking a look at different th at, at things from a slightly different angle. So what I want to talk about today is about another misconception, not one of the big ones like Jen came up with, but with one that I've heard people talking about and which I've been actually through for some strange reasons beyond my control and despite better knowledge, which is the idea, oh, okay, oh, first off, about me, that's all the stuff, yes, you know, about the right meeting. I've been doing AppFix for a couple of years now, like since 2003, uh, done a number of deployments. The basic idea, what I, what I, what I want to talk about is we had AppFix to our external mail servers, to our external web servers, and otherwise we just continue to use IPv4. I've heard that so often, and it's so ridiculously dangerous, uh, I decided uh, there might be some people out here who should be warned that this is not the way you want to go. First question is, does this work? Obvious answer is no. Why not? Well, because I wouldn't have anything to talk about for the next half hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, forgot about DNS. Oops. Yeah, OK. So we also need DNS somehow for this to work. And we forgot about the networks. Uh, OK, yeah, well, that's obvious. So, And we forgot about our ISP, uh, ISP transit provider, BGP, PS, whatever line of business you are actually in. So. This approach isn't as simple as it looks, because there's some other stuff involved there. What about mail? Mail itself, does that work if we just follow this approach? Well, maybe, kind of. But what about spam filters? I don't know if anybody here has been doing IPv6 for long enough to remember the time when some major spam filter software decided to take a look at the received headers in mails, which should contain IP addresses, which are numbers and periods, and that's it. And no colons and no letters and nothing. And uh, we had that, it must have been about 10 years ago, that all of a sudden a whole lot of people had lots of trouble with their mail because they weren't delivered to some off-sites because the spam filters over there decided that received header is broken, that's obviously spam, drop it, no error message, no nothing. So um, that story is from a long time ago, but still, spam filters, uh, depending on how they are set up and where they are located, might actually need IPv6 support as well. It's not just setting up a mail relay in between somewhere and you're done. Similar thing with IDS, IPS, virus scanners, or whatever fancy word, uh, the security people have for these things these days. Similar problem. If they don't understand about IPv6, you might actually lose mail, run into false alarms, or whatever. Um, so that's where things, where mail gets seriously complex. And you have to keep that in mind as well. Okay, so what about the web? Does that work? Well, maybe, kind of. What about literal IPv4 addresses in your web pages? And um, this happens for performance reasons. I've actually, years ago, I've, I've uh, uh, at one customer, they had a, um, a content management system that had a performance optimization feature, which took the static HTML pages and replaced all the DNS names in the HREFs with literal IPv4 addresses. Somebody actually not even came up with this meta idea, but actually managed to sell this stuff. You can have these sorts of problems, um, and you really need to check things if you want to find that before you go live. Another good one, what about the CGI script servlets or whatever else you use to generate dynamic content? And the reasons why I don't mention any, some of the, any of the uh, more recent uh, technologies there, but especially CGI scripts, because that's where it normally hurts. 
that stuff that has been in use for the last 15 years, non-stop, still implemented as an old-fashioned CGI script, does that still work with IPv6? And does your web server you use with that work with IPv6? And do those two work together if you update the web server? Because you have to. Um, so you try to follow that path. Be prepared for some nasty, annoying, and time-consuming surprises if you go that way. Right. And then there's this thing about testing in general. Now, according to a colleague of mine, every admin has a test environment. Some even have a dedicated production environment. Uh, <laughs> Mark Alba, <laughs> colleague of mine. <laughs> it's not as funny as it sounds. Um, when you start with IPv6, even if you just want to do it on the edge of your organization, you need to do some serious testing and to make sure that everything works together. If you use, if you go for IPv6, you have to test things again that you just take for granted with IPv4 because it has worked for the last 10 years and no reason to worry about it. And you know, crazy things like TCAM in some Cisco gear needing to be reconfigured, which is happening outside the, the operating system, the iOS on a Cisco, but before in firmware, uh, you come across these things and you're just saying, there, what, what, what on earth is happening here? Why doesn't this work? I've seen other things. They, there was another good, good thing, sort of related to this, not mail and web service, but you can get across these. A network printer that did IPv4, it also did IPv6. What it didn't do was dual stack. Mom did saw a root advertisement, it switched off IPv4. <laughs> These things happen. And uh, you really want to make sure you have a proper test set up. And getting that funded, getting it set up, getting everything set up like you have your production actually takes quite a bit of time. It's not like, oh, we do that over the weekend. Not, just, not even just with a mail and web server approach. Okay, so we got everything sorted out. Should that work? Well, maybe. Problem is, we don't know. Why don't we know? As Jen said, well, we forgot monitoring. And um, now that depends on what kind of organization you're working in, what their attitude towards monitoring is. I've basically kind of grown up professional, uh, professionally in a setup where the fundamental idea was, unless monitoring explicitly states that it works, it's by definition broken. So all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where you have to test everything for IPv4 and IPv6. Especially if you want to offer your services to OldStack. You have to tell your software developers, you know, the ones doing all the dynamic content stuff and so on. You have to check for IPv4 and IPv6. Yeah, but we don't even deal with IP as such. We just use our frameworks, whatever, uh, CMS stuff. And then you know you have a bit of a problem because you still have to test everything. And it might not be half as easy to actually come up with a way to tell your test framework or your monitoring, try it with IPv4, try it with IPv6. Recurrent problem. It happens all the time. And without monitoring, I personally never go live with anything. Well, because maybe you might be less risk adverse than I am in that respect yet. Okay, so. Another reason why this idea is bad is the futurologist, futurologist, <laughs> I need more caffeine. You know what I mean. These people who have these glass balls and crystal balls and they decide what the future, future is going to look like. So where are we heading? Okay, IPv4 is getting more and more crippled. Um, 
I've been doing IPv6 training since 2004. And I really loved it when DS Lite came around. Because first, one of the first questions you do in a train like this, anybody here victim of so-and-so ISP doing DS Lite? Well, yes. OK, you know about DS Lite. Yes. Um, and does it work? No. And um, do the IPv6 uh, enabled services for you work? like Google and things. Yes. And uh, with that, it was much easier to convince people that IPv6 was actually important from a practical point of view. That was a good thing about DS Lite. And um, things are getting worse. Next thing that's coming up, uh, Lightweight 4 over 6 and whatever else people come up with uh, won't make life much easier. So uh, that's the next thing going to happen. And of course, eventually, what's going to happen your ISPs sending out email to customers. Good news, your internet X is going to get cheaper. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Mm -hmm. And the really fine print, I mean, sort of fine print that even an insurance company would be uh, ashamed of. IP4, now five euros or five pounds or whatever, extra. And basically what happens there is most people won't read that. Their, their eyesight won't allow it anyway. And um, even if they did, IPv4, I only need internet and email. And then um, things will change. That'll mean IPv4 will go pretty quickly out of fashion. It'll get more expensive. And if it's getting more expensive, people, won't, people will stop using it. And the infrastructure still needs to be paid for, so prices will go up rather steeply. Doesn't have to do with technology, that's a business thing. Um, should still be understandable to technical people. Anyway, then they're probably going to decide, okay, IPv4 is for business customers only. I mean, these days you have to be a business customer to get a real IPv4 address, even a dynamic one. Otherwise, you're stuck with uh, DS Lite or whatever in at least some countries, with some ISPs, um, eventually they'll drop IPv4 completely. That will happen. And they won't advertise that 10 years in advance. It'll happen fairly quickly. And of course, we have another problem with the products requiring IPv6. Um, Apple decided some time ago we are not going to let any apps in our app store that don't support IPv6. Uh, at least with uh, Microsoft, well, it was Windows 7 or something, they started that with uh, both uh, home groups, which are based on IPv6 link local addresses, and uh, Direct Access, which internally uses IPv6. No way around it. They try to hide it to some degree, but inside they actually use it for good reason. Um, it's only a matter of time when people come up with something that requires IPv6. So just going with the mail and web servers and continuing to do IPv4 behind will put you in pretty much the same situation a number of banks did when they argued like that and decided, oh, we're going to do SNA for till the end of the world. And they are now struggling to get equipment, at least secondhand, and uh, find some people who know what they do, how to keep that running and everything. So. In the long run, trying to run IPv4 um, in, in your internal networks is not really an option. It's just, it's, you can do that for some time, but it's not going to last forever. Um, yeah, and then of course there's eventually the problem that IPv4 experience might be getting kind of rare. So eventually people retire and New kids <laughs> don't know about IP4. Anybody here still remember IPX? I'm scared. <laughs> SNA? Okay. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Apple Talk? <laughs> sorry? X25. I. Uh... Okay. But it looks like we're a bunch of old farts here. 
that is going to be a problem, especially if you work in, in an environment. Um, I've got a degree in, com degree in computer science, and uh, from the people I went to university with, I don't think anybody's still doing technical stuff. <laughs> Eventually, you wind up in management, so you need the younger people to actually do the technical work, uh, unless you have an attitude like me and still want to. Um, <coughs> This can be really a problem. You need a number of people who can do support for IPv4, and they'll, they'll be getting hard to get hold of. Uh, but that leads to the real problem, I'm the real, real problem, people. Don't know many of you, there's, there's a very nice book, horrible t title, horrible layout, horrible layout uh, Joe Weinberg's The Secret of Consulting. And in there, in the, I think in the, in, the, in the introductory part, it says there's, no matter what it looks like, it's always a people problem. IPv6 is nowhere near a technical issue anymore. That was 15 years ago. That was fun. Today, IPv6 is a people problem. And uh, when it comes to IPv6, we, we, we need people to deal with it. We have operations in the broadest possible sense, system administrators, network administrators, user help desk, and those are normally a lot of people. Um, you have to bring those up to speed. So if you're with a customer that has like 500 people working in IT, you need those. You have to 500 people to get up to speed. It includes the developers as well. And there are a number of software developers out here who don't know anything about, well, networking in general, that's not the bad part, but don't know about IPv6. Operations, still an issue. Um, I've had several people in trainings who have been uh, Cisco or MCSE, Microsoft uh, certified, whatever, and what they learned in their official trainings, where they, IPv6 was part of the agenda, um, their trainers telling them, okay, I just, just forget about that, get everything else right. Yeah, that a number of people say. And uh, basically means even if you get a certified MCSE, CCNP, whatever, doesn't mean they really understand about IPv6. You can't really depend on that. Then there's managers. The biggest problem in IT, at least when it comes to IPv6. <laughs> yes, definitely, because, no, I, and, and I'm serious about that. Those are the people who allocate resources and who set priorities. And IPv6 these days, in most cases, is a problem because of them. Because they have other more important things for people to work on. Huge problem. Best, best way to, to uh, deal with those, make sure they get uh, their in home internet access um, behind the DS Lite uh, setup. That actually works. And then there's the corporate lawyers. What are they there for? Well, we have to deal with external suppliers and contractors. And that's actually serious. You actually have to tell these people, lawyers, about IPv6. They have to deal with your ISPs. ISPs sell, tells you, yes, IPv6, not a problem. And the fine print says, oh, it's just in uh, pilot phase, so no service level agreements, no nothing. You don't want to work like that? Might not be the very best idea. They might tell you, yeah, OK, IPv6, no problem, service level agreement, and uh, as long as you don't ask about um, uh, contractual penalties sort of thing. And that means they don't care. DNS operators. Now I had one case uh, with a customer. We deployed IPv6 with this mail and web service first because something completely unexpected happened that basically tied up all resources they had and we had to do something. We wound up, we replanned the program or project and did just this mail and web server thing. But we took care of the people. Last thing that happened, we went live 
we had an external DNS operator, so they get got a, um, a change. Please add IPv6 address to these and these and these names. They do that overnight. Next morning, I got there. Any problems with IPv6? No, IPv6 is working fine. We have a problem with IPv4, though. Okay, that's not exactly my, my problem. Well, wouldn't put it like that. What do you mean? Turned out that this DNS operator had added the quad A records for IPv6, and at the same time, deleting the A records for IPv4. <laughs> okay, so that was new to them. Bad enough. Shit happens and then you die. Um, the really ugly part about it was they didn't, didn't lower the TTLs either. So it took about two days for everything to converge again. And that's when you need the lawyers. <laughs> Seriously. Data center operators. You, you have your stuff um, housed in a, in a data center you don't control. You want to make sure they, those people know what they are doing especially if you use part of the infrastructure. IT outsources. Yes, of course, uh, IPv6, no problem. Next thing, and I've had that happen. Um, people giving me a call, we need a training IPv6 as soon as possible. Okay, went there the next day. They meant as soon as possible. Um, and it turned out that they were a data center operator. And one of the sales people was asked by a customer, uh, so what about IPv6? Not a problem. And uh, how much would that be? Well, exactly what do you need? IPv6, all. Uh, and you need a fixed price. Next thing that happened, this sales guy talked to his technical, what on earth is IPv6? <laughs> and then he asked me to give him a quick training. That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't for them. So you can have nasty surprises there. Um, but the big question, the real big question, the question you should ask yourself and your boss if you want to do mail and web service first is, do you really want you and your entire technical people Gather your first IPv6 experience with externally visible and business critical services. Do you really want to do that? And uh, I have an answer to that question. <laughs> I've been through that uh, with a customer. We, had, we started with a regular IPv6 project, then things happened and we had to go this way. It wasn't nice. It definitely wasn't nice, and uh, it's kind of unfair towards your people. It's kind of unfair to your boss in, in a way because uh, there'll be some business impact quite likely as well, and um, you're just not doing yourself a favor if you follow this approach. Things happen, sometimes you have to, but at least be aware of these consequences. And if you're confronted with somebody who comes up with this idea. Try to remember a few of the things I said. Might help uh, to avoid you getting into a situation you really don't want to get into. Okay, that's it. Contact details in case you uh, see me and um, in case you don't speak German, that motto in there is um, to solve a problem you have to get to the bottom. Only in German to the bottom means also means find the root cause. Same thing. And uh, I don't know if it's still a problem, but like 18 years ago uh, in Cape Town, there were some locals who just hang about 120 pounds of lead on your, around your neck and throw you in a tank of sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, apparently they don't do that anymore. OK, questions, anybody? You mentioned early on numeric IPv4 addresses in URLs. 
Has that problem not gone away thanks to Google's, Google's punishment of HTTP? And now we have HTTPS and you don't have certificates with numeric IP addresses. That would be nice, but there are web services that are not really dependent on Google. So like your online banking, for example, they don't care too much about their Google ranking. And uh, with that... Uh, even, even in Chrome, all the warnings that come up if you have HTTP nowadays? It has worked for 10 years. We've paid a lot of money for it, and we're not going to change it because you're complaining. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> it's, it's, you, you come across that sort of reasoning a lot of times. And again, it's frequently the stuff that's 10 or 20 years old. Try to find somebody who can actually deal with a, with a CGI script written in Perl back then to sort that out. And then you do get these answers. Okay? Um, there was Any <coughs> more questions? So while people are thinking, I'll ask a question then. So you frequently hear people say it's a good idea to make your public facing services V6 capable so that you give a robust experience to people that might be connecting from IPv4 only networks. They don't have to rely on um, mm -hmm. NAT64. I'm on the stage, so I can say it as a bingo word, um, or DNS64. Um, how would you say they do approach that task, given that's the end goal? Um, mm -hmm. I can see what you're saying in the message is you, know, you don't want to be in a position where you suddenly have to rush to do that, and that's the first yes. thing you're doing. What's your general advice then? Is it that they should just go to someone like Cloudflare or AWS CloudFront or something like that to put it behind some CDN? Or do you think it's something they should be doing themselves? What would your general advice be if someone said to you, I've heard it's, that, therefore okay. what should I do? That's, general advice on that is really difficult because it really depends on who you are and what you do. If you're small, if, if you're um, pizza delivery service, you're not going to go to Akamai to get your stuff behind an, uh, um, um, a content delivery network. Um, carrier grade NAT, DS Lite, and so on are outside your control. NAT64, DNS64, I don't like those. I, I generally don't like the so called transition mechanisms because they add tremendous complexity, cause a lot of work. And in the end, um, they only buy you time that you then squander for other things again because boss says, well, but it's working. Take care of, get my new iPhone to, so I can uh, read email on it or whatever. And you don't get a chance to sort things out properly. So none of these things are really, really an option. And especially when it comes to NAT64, NAT64 basically means DNSSEC doesn't work anymore. And that should actually be a reason to stay way away from it. I understand that people need it. There are no ways around it. But you should be aware uh, about the, the negative side effects that actually has. You really, really want to avoid that if, if you can. So if people want to read about that, there's a really good blog piece by Jeff Houston on the APNIC site about the issues of DNSSEC and yes. six 64 I think. So have any, has anyone come up with any questions? There, there's there's another one up there. Ah. Oh, hang on. Let me get you a microphone so people can hear you, Nick. Sorry. It's, it's just that DNSSEC is, is a nice to have. And if you haven't got enough IP addresses, you know. Yes. <laughs> I, what happens? I, yeah? <laughs> I understand that you can find yourself in a situation where you can't get around. Fair enough. But um, if we're talking enterprise, academic, academic whatever organization, um, you should try to avoid that situation. If you're an ISP, especially mobile sector, uh, <laughs> there are not that many options left anymore. And, um, you don't, you don't control that at that point because the problem at that point is not so much what you do, but what the content providers do. And if they only deliver IPv4, but no IPv6, what else can you do? Sure, fair enough. OK, 
Okay. So my okay. experience is you had a big list of you know people who are pain in the neck, lawyers, accountants, and so on. Mm -hmm. Get those people on site is, is the way we've had a lot of success. So the DNS set yes. on is great. <clears throat> you know We've deployed DNS sec on your site. Unfortunately, because you haven't deployed V6, anyone on any of these new networks doesn't get the security benefit. That'll look bad in your audit. Yes. You know, um, similarly, accountants, they love bills. Send them bills. Um, <laughs> they really like them. In fact, they often wander into the developers and ask the developers what the bill is yes. for, and then developers have to go talk to procurement. If you yes. want a motivated developer to go and learn about IPv6 and do some stuff, make him talk to procurement. Yes. So, yes. yeah, you know, we've, we've had a lot of success with, with going v6 only and saying, here are a bunch of problems that you're going to have if you don't do this, and you can just evade them all now. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Um, and, I mean, the other thing, actually, is you very much came across as, here's a whole bunch of really nasty stuff that you find when deploying v6. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like v4 is a world of happiness, right? You know, I've done three acquisitions. I have two overlapping management networks, right? Because mm -hmm. they're all in the same RFC 1918 space, right? Mm -hmm. Hello, Nat. Oh, gosh, that's a nice day. What's the solution? v6, the entire management network, and give yes. everyone addressing. Yes. So, um, but yeah, you know, the, the main thing is, you know, iterate the problems with not doing v6. You know, these are things that are really going to bite. Mm -hmm. um, and in, I mean, in fact, uh, two of my acquisitions basically sold out because they were unable to get v4 space at a price that would allow them to continue the business. So it's like, here's a pound, thanks for your ISP. Um, so, you know, um, this is a real consequence of, of, of lack of v4. Um, yes. when, your, when your hosting provider turns around and sends you a massive bill, um, yes. folding is your option. Yes, I mean this is really, you only get into this in the situation where you need to follow, use this approach if you didn't start in time. If you have a bit of time, start with IPv6 in internal networks for internal purposes where it doesn't hurt as badly and people can get some experience and that actually helps once you have to deal with your uh, externally visible services. Um, sure. And when it comes to talking to other people, try to speak the languages. Language always helps. Helps if you're an operations people and talk to software developers. Means it helps if you talk to management, to accounting, to the lawyers, whatever. And uh, it's something you actually you're well advised to learn at some point. Mm -hmm. And um, you have that at a technical level. I've, I've been I've been dealing with people, network people, the Linux people yelling at each other, network people saying, we're going to use port channel, Linux people saying, no, we're going to use bonding interfaces. That happens a lot of times. And uh, you frequently need to sort of translate between the two to make them realize they're talking about the same thing. Same applies to management, to lawyers, whatever. OK. OK. Uh, I'd just like to comment on uh, some of the points there in that uh, you were saying about mm -hmm. would you really want to make this change on a business critical service? It ties into what Jen said earlier about do you want to do this when it's 1% or when it's 25%? Exactly. And the broader thing is you don't get to choose what the rest of the ecosystem in the internet is up to and their rates of change. Yes. Uh, in a past job, I remember uh, we had lots of Calls complaining about not being able to reach a popular uh, online banking system mm -hmm. who had not actually enabled v6. However, they had just changed something and actually broke all v6 mm -hmm. uh, by returning different uh, uh, non existent SIR files on quad A queries yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But they were insistent it had to be our fault because they hadn't changed anything. But, but we, yes. we, we must be at fault because we have lots of V6 and it's only us that has a problem. So the way you can, only way you can sort of guard against this is just by running a relatively clean shop with the yes. least transition translation mechanisms yeah. you can get away with for your need and then just go and fight the fight when you're accused yes. of being the problem. Yes, mm. and believe me, that happens a lot of time when you have, I mean, there are not that many people, people who understand uh, networking in general. And uh, when it comes to IPv6, knowledge is even more restricted with a lot of people. And then that's when these blame games actually start. Um, try to keep your things as simple as possible. Uh, another thing 
I thought about uh, offering here to present is uh, why I don't consider indiscriminate dual stacking uh, much of an option. That would have been another uh, interesting topic, but I, I didn't know what sort of audience here to expect and decided mm, they might already know about that. But this one is, um, on one hand, pretty specific, and on the other hand, uh, gives a number of ideas about the problems you run mm. into when you do real world IPv6. No, I think it's a really good talk in that, as I said with my question, there's a lot of advice out there to make content available over v6 so that, for example, NAT64 is then a reducing NAT. The more content that's available over v6, the less there is a need for NAT64. Yes. So there's a, a dichotomy there but between those two issues. And yes, of course you can make a comment. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm large enterprise looking from inside out, and I need mm -hmm. that bleeping NAT64, because if I turn mm -hmm. all my internal network to v6 yep. only, I cut off my users from 74% of the internet. So that's my pain. Um, right? Yes, but um, depends on the sort of network you're in. Uh, a lot of customers I've had, they have uh, real firewalls and things, so all web-based uh, stuff goes through a web proxy, an application mm -hmm. level gateway inside the firewall. So you get a protocol specific layer seven translation, which is pretty reliable. Not 6.4, we have the DNS uh, 6.4 problem and we also have the problem that it doesn't work with all protocols. And that's what's causing a lot of work for first level support. So my internet works, I can reach Google which helps to be up physics anyway, but try to tell that to an end user. But zip there and there doesn't work. And that, if you have the average first level supporter confronted with this sort of problem, um, you get all sorts of answers, but rarely uh -huh. any helpful, I helpful know. one. I'm running such a network, so yeah, but I can't, I, can't, I can't go without it. The second one, to give hope to anybody who has done an AC score or other certifications, Based mm -hmm. on my recertification experience, the number mm -hmm. of IPv6 questions is getting greater. So yes. those instructors who advise people forget yes. about IPv6, they are bad instructors and don't listen yes. to them. And the, the bad instructors are getting, well, either they finally found some time to figure out what this IPv6 thing is by now, so they're not afraid to explain that to people afterwards either, or they just go out of business anyway. Okay, so we'll, um, conclude there. Thank you very much, Benedict. You're welcome.